Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. And today we have the opportunity to visit with spiritual elder, author, and activist, Matthew Fox. Hey, Matthew, how you doing? Hello, Aaron. Good to be with you. It's good to be with you as well, my friend. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation and uh, sharing it with our audience. Matthew Fox is an elder activist, spiritual theologian, and the author of 40 books on spirituality and culture. He has taught at Stanford University and is the founder of the University of Creation Spirituality. He was a member of the Dominican Order of the Roman Catholic Church for 34 years until silenced by the Vatican in 1989 and formally dismissed in 1993. Now an Episcopal priest, he travels extensively sharing his vision of a spirituality that includes mysticism and social justice rather than patriarchal orthodoxy and that celebrates the marriage of the divine feminine and the sacred masculine and matthew for our for our conversation today i'm, I'm so thrilled that uh, while we're, we're going to discuss a few different dimensions of, of your work and, and some of your other books we're going to focus for the most part on this particular work that you've written about hildegard of bingen a saint for our times unleashing her power in the 21st century and uh I'm curious to ask, just to kick things off, Matthew, why Hildegard von Bingen, what's important about a woman from some 900 years ago to our world today? Well, she was a Benedictine abbess in the 12th century, and the 12th century was a very special century. A Parish Chanu, my mentor's great historian, says the 12th century Renaissance is the only Renaissance that worked in the West. The 16th century Renaissance that gets all the, the news and the spotlight, it was top down. But the 12th century was bottom up. It was freed serfs. It was young people, therefore. And it was women. And um, uh, it was a different kind of Renaissance from the bottom up. And Hildegard lived through that. Uh, she lived from 1098 to, what, 11... 81, I think. So she lived through a big part of the 12th century, and she was a big part of it because she was such a genius in music, for example, but also in, she wrote 10 books, um, several of them on science, as far as they had science in that day. One book is all about stones and rocks and animals and trees and so forth. And uh, she had this voracious curiosity and um uh, she was a shaker and a mover. She was a painter. She wrote the oldest opera in the West by 300 years, uh, including the libretto. She was a poet and um, she was a healer. And uh, she, she was true to her womanhood. She grew up, if you will, in a Celtic monastery where men and women lived together though in different parts of the building, but they got together. And uh, when her first book came out, it became so popular that a lot of women wanted to study with her. So they came to the monastery to join and the men wouldn't move over and give room. So she took all her nuns and moved out <laughs> with their dowries. Back then you'd have a dowry to be in that and started her own monastery. And it became so full, she had to start a second one across the river Rhine. And um, we have a letter from the abbot saying, oh, come back, come back, bring the nuns and bring their dowries with you. <laughs> and her letter back to him, which we have, is all about injustice, that she didn't think she was treated well. So she just moved on. So she was a strong woman uh, in a time of, uh, of great efforts by, by the patriarchal establishment to keep women in their place. <laughs> she did not, uh, can I say, go along with that. Uh, happily. So she's a tremendous uh, figure. And um, uh, she was just canonized a saint about 10 years ago and made a doctor of the church. And there are only three other women who were doctor of the church. So she was a, a genius, no question about it, and, and a great soul. And um, uh, so she's speaking to us today because, for one thing, she's so earth conscious that she has an entire understanding of the importance of, she calls, talks about Mother Earth, 
uh, who's the mother of all things, contains the seeds of all things, and she says, we must not uh, destroy Mother Earth. And uh, so obviously she's an eco-prophet. She's uh, a great voice in favor of opening up our minds that we're not just here to serve each other, but to serve future generations and Earth itself and, all, and the other creatures. So she's a, a real ecological prophet in that way. And um, she has a lot of lessons that are really important to us today. I really appreciate how in the in the book you tease out so much of her wisdom and thread those lessons together with some other more contemporary authors' works. And what one of the things you mentioned very early on in the book is that Hildegard von Bingen is is a herald of the divine feminine. And I was I was hoping you could walk us through what what does that mean and why is that especially important now given the the history and the legacy of a of an out of balance patriarchy yes you know um rosemary ruther was great catholic um women theologian feminist theologian she says that the basis of patriarchy in its shadow side is dualism uh, the separation of matter and spirit, the separation of soul and body and so forth. And um, Hildegard in so many ways heals that dualism that she's, she talks about how Christ is present in everything, how there's a radiance in all beings. And that radiance is the, the ducts of the glory of the divine. And um, so she brings us back to, to this consciousness of microcosm and macrocosm. That too is her way she looked at psychology. And by the way, Carl Jung knew Hildegard very well. And he says the future of psychology is microcosm, macrocosm. So that, so that we humans are the microcosm, we're a small cosmos, but we relate to the whole cosmos, the macrocosm. Well, that opens the door to, to web telescope and everything we're learning about the cosmos to the 13.8 billion year story that we're learning about our our history and and that of the earth and all the rest so it's a tremendous opening because modern consciousness and obviously hildegard is pre-modern living in the 12th century but she she thinks like indigenous people do you see in fact the very first time i translated her a couple of her poems and I shared them in class, a master's degree class. Uh, I just shared one of her poems, and immediately this young man spoke up. He said, I've just returned from living on an Indian reservation for 13 years. That lady you just cited sounds exactly like the medicine man who was my spiritual teacher, um, spiritual director. I, I was just hit, hit by that. I was amazed. First time it had dawned on me that a 12th century man is thinking like a 20th century um, Lakota man, medicine man. And she is because, of course, all medieval mystics, Meister Eckhart and Thomas Aquinas and Francis of Assisi, of course, and Julian North, they all thought more like indigenous people do than modern consciousness does. Because the modern begins with the human, with the part and not with the whole. Um, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. No, Mr. Descartes. You are, because 13.8 billion years birthed you, birthed the earth, and out of that comes us. So, you know, it's not all about I. And yet the modern culture has been all about I, and that's why it's all collapsing today. That's why education isn't working, religion isn't working, and economics and politics aren't working. And the earth herself, of course, is under such stress. So um, all this is part of Hildegard's way of seeing the world seeing the context in which humans bring something special. We bring our creativity and she's, she herself is, a, is an, a proof of that with her gifts of music and painting and, and healing and so much else. She's so in touch with her deeper nature and her creative nature. So all this is part of the return of, of compassion and the return of, of the, um, the feminine energy of creativity and wisdom. She says, this is a great line. She says, there's wisdom in all creative works, wisdom in all creative works. 
We see our patriarchal educational system for centuries has focused on knowledge. And we've discovered a lot. We discovered so much, we got into computers to store all our information. But where are we on the spectrum of wisdom? When it comes to wisdom, we're pretty short, shorted. <laughs> and um, so we should be looking at people like, like Hildegard for wisdom that, that matches our knowledge. Because knowledge alone can blow up the world, as we know, and as we can see going on in Ukraine. So um, uh, she, remember that wisdom is feminine around the world, feminine in the biblical languages, feminine around the world, Quan Yin and all the rest. And, uh, of course, compassion is a feminine energy. It really comes from the word for womb in both Hebrew and Arabic. The word for womb gives us the word for compassion. So, and that doesn't mean women hold all compassion or women hold all wisdom. Um, it's about really recovering the deeper dimensions of masculinity that are, are left out when patriarchy is defining masculinity in its very limited way of the reptilian brain being number one and uh, conquering everyone else like, like a rep, like a crocodile <laughs> does. So, um, this is why uh, Hildegard can shake up both our understanding of the feminine, but our understanding of, of the masculine as well, and of our institutions. In fact, I end that book, and you got that far, but it's, it's kind of uh, satirical. My conclusion chapter is entitled, Is Hildegard a Trojan Horse in the Vatican? Because the person who are, or, uh, canonized her, made her back to the church, is Cardinal Razzi, or Benedict XVI, Pope XVI. And he's anything but a feminist. I mean, he came after me. His first objection to my work was, quote, I am a feminist theologian. And his second objection was that I call God mother. So that fellow is in no way on Hildegard's side when it comes to her feminism. But that's why I call her a Trojan horse. He did it. He named her a saint and a doctor of the church and wheeled her right into the Vatican uh, uh, front door, at the Vatican front door. And this lady is going is going to Pour out of that that um, horse with a lot of other strong women and men who are in touch with the, uh, the feminine angle on things and could really do a job on uh, on our patriarchal institutions. And the Roman Catholic Church is a pretty good place to start. No doubt about it. It's uh, it's so interesting to me how that sense of of spiritual connection that is so profoundly connected to the natural living world to mother earth to creation to the the greening power of the plant kingdom that provides life to this planet and it seems there's so many of us these days matthew who are so disconnected from that intimate relationship that hildegard speaks of so many of us not even aware that we're disconnected, not even aware that there's there's this entirely different way of of being in communion and community with the living earth. And I'm I'm, I'm curious because I think this is such a foundational, important aspect of Hildegard's work and what she means in our time today. What what does this look like and mean to you? This this intimate connection with nature. What why is it important? How do we cultivate it? Well, I like that you just used the, the term intimate twice, because that's so much a part of it, recovering our intimate relation to nature, because after all, nature feeds us, and nature is us, and our breath is in, in uh, all the languages of the world, practically, certainly biblical language, but around the world, the word for spirit and breath are the same words. So, and of course, we now know that uh, breath, as we know it, is the air that we breathe, but it, it runs out about 10 miles from here. <laughs> when you get up to the stratosphere, there's no air. So, you know, astronauts have to bring air with them and so forth. So, you know, we're, the lesson is, hey, don't take it for granted. Don't take air for granted. Don't take healthy air for granted. And don't take your lungs for granted, you know. So, um as you say, what's more intimate than air? You know, the breath that we breathe. And, you know, a lot of spiritual practices 
uh, uh, meditations are indeed about paying attention to your breath, not taking it for granted, and following that rhythm, uh, putting yourself in the presence of breath and rhythm. But it's not just breath that nature gives us, it's food, literally, plants and photosynthesis and animals who eat plants and birds that eat plants and all the rest. So, I mean, where are we without, without nature? We're, we're dead. <laughs> we're out of here. And uh, so, again, we can take for granted for so long. And I think that, again, the modern era, the great thrust of the whole era was about conquering and about um, uh, knowledge. And knowledge in itself is not bad, but too much knowledge and too little wisdom is very, very dangerous in the hands of human beings because we can tear down a rainforest in a day that has taken nature and God 10,000 years to give birth to. And once we tear down a rainforest, it doesn't come back as a rainforest. Um, so, and rainforests, we're learning more and more are so basic to our survival, not just because of the absorbed carbon dioxide and recycle it and so forth, but also because there are so many plants that are medicinal there, so many we haven't even discovered yet, that um, there are so many other gifts that the rainforest gives us. But we all have to recover, where you say, this intimate relationship and that with Earth. And that's how Hildegard talks, too. She actually says that the relationship of the divine to nature is that of a husband to wife and of lovers to each other. That there's something intimate going on here between the the creator and creation. And uh, why would we want not to be part of that? And um, so her approach to ecology is not about stewardship. It's not about we have to do this duty. It is about how do lovers act with each other? And, you know, you don't ignore one another and you don't take for granted and you give and you receive. And again, this is a very indigenous approach to our relationship to the earth that um, you can't just be taking all the time. As a species, we have to give back as well. We have to uh, return and recycle and we have to think of future generations. Uh, how healthy will our grandchildren's uh, world be in terms of earth, air, fire, energy, and water? Those are essential questions today, as they have always been. Only today, we're in a perilous situation, obviously, that we're coming to the, to the end of the line, that our species has so overdone our rapacious reptilian brain uh, approach to nature, that nature is beginning to bite us. And she, she predicted that would happen. She said, we live in a, in a web of life. Creation is a web. And uh, we're in this web with all these other creatures. And of course, a web is flexible. It goes with the wind and so forth. It's strong, but flexible. It's not rigid. But she says, if human injustice and greed breaks this web, the way she puts it is God will allow creation to punish humanity. So it's not God coming at us with vengeance. It's creation that uh, if we cannot honor the other creatures and the, our relationships with them in this web, that uh, if we break the web, well, it, that's what we've been warned by scientists today. The seas are going to rise and they're going to be drought. There already is. There are going to be more floods and more hurricanes, and there already is, and more wildfires, and there already is that going on. So, you know, she actually, I think, warned us what, what an ego uh, uh, approach to nature does, which includes, of course, forgetting it and just thinking it's a, it's a, a resource that we can extract uh, continually. Obviously, it's a finite resource. And we cannot just extract. But, you know, there are many humans today, and a lot of scientists, who are, of course, seeing the trouble we're in and are putting into gear our wonderful imaginations and intellects to create alternative energy and all the rest. And she talks about that, too. She says the greatest gift that humans have is our intellect. And uh, which is an acknowledgement, obviously, that uh, a healthy 
feminine, like a healthy masculine, honors the rational as well as the intuitive. And she she had both in her. That's why she was so keen on science. She says all science comes from God. So there was nothing anti-intellectual about Hildegard. She was thoroughly curious and uh, a student of science insofar as it was available in her time. There's one story about her that I think is fun. It says a lot about her personality. One day she got a message from Switzerland that there was a, um, a possessed woman in Switzerland. And they wanted her to come down and do an exorcism. She wrote back and said, I don't do exorcisms, but boy, do I want to see a possessed woman. So I'm getting on the next boat. <laughs> so I just think that's very telling of her personality. She was radically curious, as any good scientist should be. And she was going to check it out for herself. So I think that's a fun story, among other things. And by the way, she was preaching all over Germany and Switzerland, too. And we have letters from bishops saying, uh, will you send us a copy of your the sermon you gave? People are still talking about it. And it's been three months since you were here. <laughs> so, And her main message was to stir up the clergy. She said the clergy are too lazy. They're not prophetic enough. And she wrote letters to the emperor, to the pope, to archbishops, to abbots, telling them they were failing. And they were, um, I mean, she told the pope he was surrounded by evil men who, who act like hens and uh, hackling at night and so forth. <laughs> he said, throw off these evil people around you and everything. And she wrote the Emperor Barbarossa and said, you know, man up. You're acting like a baby. Your job is to do justice. It's not to preen yourself and all the rest. And she wrote Abbots and said that they acted like asses and donkeys and bears. They grumble like a bear. I mean, she didn't uh, hold back when she took on the uh, potentates of her time. And yet they listened to her. I think they were scared of her, frankly, because uh, she claimed to have visions. She painted her visions. And uh, I think they figured that she had more access to the spiritual world than they did. And, and they were probably right. Wow. <laughs> you mentioned Switzerland and, and Germany. And in the book, you discuss what you call the Rhineland mystic movement. And of course, the Rhine River runs from Switzerland down to the northwest, more or less to the lowlands of Germany and out toward Holland. Can you tell us a bit about this region and what was going on in this time and, and how there are other important individuals, some of whom you've already mentioned in addition to Hildegard von Bingen that were in this region at this time and kind of what was going on in the world right. then? Sure. And of course, Bingen is right on the Rhine, and you can visit her monastery today uh, in its current state. The, the one she built was destroyed in the 17th century by the Swedish, Swedes when they invaded, but they built a new one, but it's on the same grounds. But um, yeah, I call it the grandmother Rhineland mystics, and the Rhineland mystic movement certainly includes um, Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas. Um, he studied in Cologne, and um, Albert worked in Cologne. And of course, uh, Meister Eckhart, because he worked in Strasbourg and in Cologne, preached in Cologne and there. And um, of course, the Rhine was, was a great river, not unlike the Mississippi in terms of its, its dominance, its importance for um, commerce and business. And of course, in that time, you didn't have the highways we have today. You had dirt roads, but the point is, you did most of the work by by boat, and um, um, so you, these great cities were on the Rhine, and uh, so you had the the Celts settled there early, and Hildegard was actually in a Celtic monastery on the Rhine in Germany, uh, and uh, that's why she lived in a in a bi gender monastery because the Celts. Uh, weren't uh, those about bringing men and women together. They weren't as hung up on sex as the Southern Europeans were, like Augustine and, um, in, in Italy. But um, uh, so the Rhine even produced, I think, the Rhineland mystics, I think, 
he, uh, Francis of Assisi, though, he, he lived in northern Italy, but the Celts settled into northern Italy. And Francis of Assisi is very Celtic also in his spirituality. Like Hildegard, very nature-oriented, very oriented to the animals and to the cosmos, too. Um, his greatest poem, he doesn't even mention Jesus once, but he talks about brother, son, and sister moon, and so forth. So a very cosmic view of the world. Very Celtic, therefore. And um, so, and then Julian Norwich, of course, lived in England, not on the Rhine, literally, but in fact, she's part of the Rhineland mystic movement because she drew from these great mystics that came from the Rhine, directly or indirectly. So Hildegard was first. Francis of Sisi was born two years after Hildegard died. So the lineage goes Hildegard, Francis, then Thomas Aquinas, Mechthild the Magdeburg. Magdeburg is a city in Germany. And, um, and then Meister Eckhart, as I say, who was, um, who worked on the Rhine and, and was German from Thuringia. And then, um, Julian and Ulrich over, over in Norwich. So, so it's a wonderful movement of healthy creation centered and really Celtic based, um, uh, mystic prophets. Uh, they weren't just mystics. They also stood up and were counted and got in trouble. I mean, that's why, you know, Hildegard wasn't or was canonized for 800 years. That's a long time to wait. That's like a record almost. And why? Well, because when she was 81, she was excommunicated by an archbishop, along with all of her nuns. They were interdicted, which means her whole monastery was excommunicated, told to shut up. They couldn't even sing the office anymore. And she wrote a letter back to the archbishop and said, oh, dear archbishop, we are obeying you. We're not singing our our office anymore. Our, our, um, and uh, she said, you've silenced the most beautiful music on the Rhine, meaning her own. <laughs> which was literally true. <laughs> and, uh, and then she said, all prophets need music. And she talked about David and she talked about all the prophets who made music. And the, but you've chosen to silence music. And she, she goes on and on. And at the end, she signs it in space. She says, those who choose to silence music in this lifetime will go to a place in the next where there is no music. Now, for literally... For Hildegard, that literally means she's telling the bishop he's going to hell. Because when Hildegard did her opera, uh, it's about the virtues, the play of the virtues. And so charity is singing away, and, and countenance is singing away, and wisdom is singing away. But the devil in the play is walking around talking and mumbling. He can't sing, you see. Devils, devils don't sing. She thinks heaven is a place of music. And um, so that has to be mo the most creative way anyone has ever told the archbishop they're going to hell. And I think that's one very important reason why she wasn't canonized for 800 years. It took, it took the hierarchy that long to, um, what should I say, get over that particular insult. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Spe <laughs> speaking of the, the virtues, and I, and I love the music thread. I'll come back to that, especially with your beautiful painting with Miles Davis behind you there. Oh, um, there you go. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and I love how there's some some verdant green in there, like some Veriditas right in there. Uh, yes. And of course, you took Veriditas, Hildegard's word for greening power, as the title for your important novel, too. So that's a special connection you two have, obviously. But remember that word for her is so rich. She says that we're this. She compares greening power, veriditas, to the sap of a tree, and she compares it to the Holy Spirit. She says the Holy Spirit is green, uh, and of course, green is the heart chakra color, isn't it? So, uh, and of course, it's very important to the Celtic people, isn't it? The green shamrock and all that. So, all this greening power, she is a very important concept to her. It's really her central concept. And um, it is about the inherent energy and, and sap of, um, of life. And this is really what, what spirituality is all about, is, is getting in tune with that, with that sap and that energy. She says, for example, the only sin in life is drying up, she says. And um, she writes bishops and abbots and says, get out of your libraries. You're, you're drying up. Do whatever it takes to get wet and green and moist and juicy. Those are her words. 
That's what spirituality is about, staying green and staying creative. And clearly she was walking her talk and, and uh, preaching from her own experience there because she was so, so creative and uh, uh, deliberate in her awareness. And she, she, she has a poem where she says, oh, Trinity, you are music. You are life. So um, this, uh, this whole idea that the music is, is behind everything. And, you know, I think that's today's physics, actually. That vibration is what makes things go around. That every atom in the universe is vibrating. Well, that's what music is. It's vibration. And she, she picked up the music of the spheres. She talks about it. She gathered her singular songs, uh, and there are 72 of them. And the title she gave the collection was the uh, Symphony of the Heavenly Revelations. So, um, you know, today, scientists are picking up the sounds, even of the earliest um, uh, sounds of the universe. And so sound is with us all the time. And, um, you know, the, the Hindus talk about in the beginning was the sound. And, and of course, John's Gospel has it, the beginning was the word. But Hildegard is... And remember, the Celts were influenced by the Hindus. I mean, the Celts came from India. So um, in a way, Hildegard is saying, in the beginning was the music. And, uh, and of course, this is what the Aboriginals in Australia say. They say that, <clears throat> that uh, every creature has its own, is, was born with its own song. And that life's journey is discovering that song and then putting it in harmony with other beings' songs so that we live harmoniously. And I think it's a very beautiful way of seeing the world. And, and again, it's, uh, it's microcosm and macrocosm, finding the sound of the universe and, um, and letting it stir us and keep us green. I remember uh, reading in one of my favorite books called Not a Brahma, The World of Sound by the German author Joachim Ernst Berendt. And he apparently was instrumental in, you know, pun intended, in bringing together some of the Western jazz musicians with some of the Eastern classical Indian uh, raga musicians. And anyway, in that book, he talks about there was a, uh, a jazz uh, musician, I'm forgetting his name, who identified the F sharp note as the green note. And it turns out that with our uh, modern instrumentation, we were able to uh, determine that when photosynthesis is occurring, the chlorophyll is vibrating at a very high frequency overtone of F sharp. And so it's in, yeah. indeed a green note. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And so, I mean, there, there really is such a, a, an incredible fundamental connection between tone, vibration, sound, music, and creation and creativity. And of course, Hildegard uh, emphasized the importance of creativity as a way of being almost a spiritual practice. And you lay out in the, in the book four different ways, right? The, the via uh, positiva, negativa, et cetera. And I was hoping you might walk us through, Matthew, quickly, those, uh, those four different ways of approaching our, our spiritual life and our, our work, our service in the world. Yeah. Yes, and I found these in, in uh, Meister Eckhart, actually. They weren't explicitly named there, but they're definitely there. So the Via Positiva is our experience of awe and wonder and joy and reverence and gratitude flows from that. The Via Negativa is, first of all, our experience of silence, that emptiness. We often call it mindfulness or, or contemplation. But it's also our experience of suffering and grief and loss chaos, and or and what this is called the dark night of the soul. So all that is part of the via negativa. And, and we all go through these, this rhythm of positive and negative. Then there's a via creativa that comes next, because out of this emptying that happens in the via negativa comes birth, comes new birth, new ideas, and a response that we make to both the joys of life and the suffering of life. And uh, that's our creativity. But our creativity needs steering, it needs direction, because we can do what we want with creativity. We can create nuclear weapons, we can invade another country like Ukraine, we can tear down rainforests in a day, 
That's all creative, but of a negative kind. So the via transformativa comes next, and that's the way of compassion and justice. And it's a way of healing and of celebration. Our compassion is not only about relieving pain, it's also about gathering to share the joy and to heal and to gin up the energy of the community. So I see those four paths as naming, and they don't stop with the via transformativa then, because I see it as an open-ended spiral that grows. And so I see it going back then to the via positive, because the purpose of justice is to bring more people to the to the banquet of life, if you will. And that's then we're back to the via positiva again. And we go through those the, that journey again. And you can see in Hildegard that she is um, playing at this depth on a regular basis, that all four of the of the path, four paths are um, named by her. They're named in her music. Uh, they're named in her writing. And they're even named in, in her life, as they are in, in all of our lives. So I think it's a very solid way. And I've been assured by Jewish scholars that it is the, the biblical way of Judaism uh, to name the, the spiritual journey in, in this way, that it culminates with justice and compassion but it begins with um, gratitude. And, and notice even Genesis 1 doesn't say anything about evil. It's all about how good nature is. And when humans come on, which is very late, as it is in the new scientific story, we're very late, um, everything is very good. So that's what I mean by original blessing, a, a term that got, got me in a lot of trouble with the Vatican, the previous Vatican, not the current one. But... Um, uh, that original goodness is is the name of the game to be born into a planet as unique and special as this that works and has all this beautiful diversity from giraffes and elephants to rainforests and the rest. Um, why wouldn't we want to call that blessing is another word for goodness and build on that. And I think that's the big struggle we're in as a species that we've got our own agenda. We've been killing each other for long enough, but that seems to be one of our favorite agendas. And uh, we've got to tap tap more into the mammal brain, which is that brain that's capable of kinship and family and forgiveness and uh, and compassion. And so, um, you know, that's how we've got to move as a species. If we're going to survive. And uh, I think that's where we're at kind of historically. And, and great mystics like Hildegard in their own way um, Lay this out for us. And, you know, she, she wrote a lot about evil, about humanity's capacity for evil, but she always balances it. Like she had one book where she lists 36 human vices, but is balanced by 36 uh, human virtues, if you will, powers. And uh, that's how she, she teaches about ethics and morality, that we've got these choices and, um, you know, we really ought to live up to them and grow up. That's why I say she she criticized the emperor for being a baby <laughs> and uh, and not manning up, not not being an adult, choosing wisely, and and that you know to bring about justice, which she considered his job, is about finding balance, and it's not just yielding to your whims for power for power's sake and all the rest. Yeah, I, I, I'm so struck by the profound connection between creativity and, and justice and service, this sense of service. I think often in our contemporary culture, we get this sense of a creative artist type as being very self-absorbed and not necessarily uh, consciously working in service to humanity, or perhaps it's only through the art itself, right? And with a an individual like Hildegard, we, we see this far more expansive approach to being in service across a variety of disciplines while also being a very creative artist. And it, it makes me think of, of one of the vices that you call out in the book, one that gets translated as sloth, uh, uh, sadia, uh, I guess is the term we uh, derive this from in the Greek. Can you Tell us a bit, Matthew, about this Asadia and, and really what it might 
mean as, as providing us a little bit of wisdom and insight in these days when I think so many of us end up feeling like, you know, perhaps there's not much we can do in the world right now and we s decide to sit on our couches instead. Right. Yes, uh, Thomas Aquinas defines a CD as a lack of energy to begin new things. And I think that's very practical, very down to earth, a lack of energy to begin new things. And I think it's so prevalent that in our lifetime, we've invented a new word for it. It's so around, and that word is couch potatoitis, as you just alluded to, that is being passive. And those who make the real decisions, the corporations and the powers behind them, um, want us to be that way. This is the agenda, that we be passive and let them make all the decisions. Well, I think it's been proven that um, making decisions to tear down rainforests and to, to uh, mine um, our carbon based energy is, is a bad decision. It's going to kill the planet as we know it, and certainly our species as we know it. So we've got a decision making. And um, to get involved means to stand up to a CDM. It means to, and then Aquinas says, What's the solution to a CDM? And he says um, that, um, that uh, zeal comes from an intense experience of the beauty of things. I think that's so beautiful. <laughs> zeal comes, that's energy. That's the opposite of a CD. That's getting out of our couch potatoes. Zeal comes from the intense experience of the beauty of things. That beauty is an answer, that being in love, and that's another thing, moving from the anthropocentric consciousness of the modern era, I think, therefore, I am, to a more broad cosmological self, is a recognition that um, uh, that the beauty of things, the beauty of the earth, as you were talking about the intimacy, uh, you know, just it can be a it can be a hummingbird. It can be something that small that alerts us that we're living in a place that we didn't make. We didn't make this planet. We didn't make the earth. We didn't even make our bodies, really. We certainly didn't make the air our bodies breathe. So, you know, let's just get a little humble and ask, where does the future lie? And it lies with that intuition of beauty and falling in love. So, the, again, the modern consciousness has us falling in love with one two-legged person until death do us part. Well, first of all, that doesn't always work. <laughs> Secondly, it's an awfully small part of the world. No, we need to fall in love with the world. It may be forests, it may be wildflowers, it may be animals, it may be um, poetry, it may be music, but uh, that's what we have to open up, and that's the pathway to moving beyond the sea. It's falling in love with something bigger than ourselves, and um, that's that's the way. So I think that... Um, Acidia names a real problem in our civilization today, so big a problem that we've made up a new word for it. That's always a good sign. Check the vocabulary. If you need a new word like couch potatoitis, well, you're undergoing something that other species, that other times of humans have not undergone. You know, you know, they, they this, there is a Australian theologian lecturing in Africa a few years ago, and he came to the culmination of his time, he was being translated after each sentence, he would pause, they would translate in Swahili. And his almost his last sentence was, the number one spiritual problem in Sydney today is loneliness. And the translator huddled with some others, said, will you repeat that sentence, please? He repeated it. So they huddled, and he came to my office and said, I'm sorry, sir, there is no word in our language for loneliness. <laughs> wow. Good God, no word in the language for loneliness. And, you know, if we know anything, we know about cosmic loneliness in, in English and in America and in Australia. So, I mean, language tells, tells us a lot, doesn't it? And uh, I think, of course, we're lonely because we're out of touch with the intimacy, as you said, of the rest of nature. And when, when you're living in a, just a man-made bubble, um, loneliness is a, is a daily, daily happening. So that's just an example, I think, that uh, we, we have to move out of this acedia, this couch potatoitis, and the path is path of beauty and falling in love.
with things that are other than just the human. I, I uh, so appreciate uh, that particular theme and thread, Matthew. And maybe I'll remind our audience, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. And I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. And today we're visiting with author, spiritual elder, uh, Matthew Fox, who's written several books. We're, we're discussing quite a bit the Hildegard of being in a saint for our times book. And uh, want to also ask in a moment and or a question about your other book, Order of the Sacred Earth, your other book among some 40 different books. Um, and real quick, I'll give a shout out to some of our sponsors who make this podcast series possible. That includes Purium, Organic Superfoods. And by the way, you can get special deals and discounts with many of our sponsors at whyonearth.org on our partners and uh, supporters page. This includes Purium. Um, Earth Hero, another that provides a variety of sustainability products for the home, the workplace, et cetera. Um, Soil Works, our in-house biodynamic uh, blended uh, soil nutrient additive for your garden and your yard, your house plants. And of course, Waylay Waters, our biodynamically and regeneratively grown hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts, excellent for our self care. Um, and, and a very special shout out to Chelsea Green Publishing, uh, the publishing company with whom we're collaborating in a few different ways. You'll hear some other episodes uh, throughout the coming months with several of their authors as well. And uh, a big shout out to our ambassadors uh, who are engaged in such beautiful, important work worldwide and uh, with whom we gather at least monthly online and or in person for ceremony, for sharing, for inspiration, for fellowship. Um, and if you haven't become an ambassador and you'd like to join and connect in that way, uh, you can go to the page on the website uh, called Become an Ambassador and engage in the journey that way. Of course, we've also got our Veritas Society, which is a, a, a recent addition where we're focusing a bit more on the ceremonial, the spiritual, the nature immersion, the wilderness immersion work, the biodynamic land stewardship work. And uh, this, Matthew, is at least in my mind and heart, very, very connected uh, in, a, in a resonant way with the organization that you've shared with the world called Order of the Sacred Earth. And uh, I find when you were speaking about loneliness uh, that I actually experience this from time to time. It surprises me actually that I can experience loneliness as often as I do, given that the work that I do has me connected with so many amazing folks like yourself doing tremendous uh, things worldwide. But there, there are these moments where I do feel this, this kind of disconnection, this kind of uh, loneliness, except when I'm in nature, I don't, I, I don't feel it. <laughs> I just don't when I'm in the woods, when I'm in the forest, when I'm in the wilderness and just came off a, a multi-day excursion with my son. I, I literally just don't feel it in that setting, Matthew. And I do feel it indoors. I do feel it with, you know, the library around me and so forth. And I'm wondering if, if you might share any insights you have about, about that. And, and also, you know, perhaps share with us a bit about what you explore in order of the sacred earth and, and what you're sharing with the world through this, this order that you've founded. Well, I certainly uh, resonate with your feeling uh, kinship in, in nature. And I think that the feelings we do have of loneliness, a lot of it may be mother earth reminding us that without an effort at that intimacy that you spoke of, um, we're we, we are selling ourselves short, and we're we're going to render ourselves more and more lonely. So um, I think there's kind of a rhythm going on there, via positive and via negative rhythm. That uh, if we deprive ourselves of the foundational relationship with nature and Mother Earth, including our own nature that uh, we're wandering in a, in a desert kind of, of loneliness. And it's going to get worse if we, if we not recover the, the sacredness of nature. And that takes us to the order of the sacred earth, that um, 
I think, you know, religions um, in many parts of the world, in the Western part, certainly, are, um, are losing a lot of their regular found, uh, attendees. Uh, churches are closing uh, and at, at record numbers, and so are seminaries and so forth. So uh, you might ask, what's next? And um, it's my reading of religious history that there have been times, of course, in the past when, uh, speaking my own Christian tradition, when the church was running out of steam and energy was, was too involved, too much in bed with the current powers that be that were not healthy powers any longer. And what happened was orders happened. So, for example, um, in the fourth century, the church married the empire. And by the fifth century, there was a lot of alienated uh, young people, especially because they were being drafted into the army to, to kill people in the name of the empire, supposedly in the name of Christ or something. Well, to make a long story short, a long story short, they ran away to the desert. And we know them as the desert fathers or the desert mothers, but they they went into nature in a deep way and said, you know, these these humans and these Christian humans are going their way. It's not my way. And then after that, you had this movement of St. Benedict in the fifth century, starting the Benedictine order, which is has lasted right up to today. Hildegard of Bingen was a member of that order. And um, he, there were men and women. His sister started the women's uh, branch. And um, this really was important, especially during the darkest stages. They kept, kept scholarship alive and education alive and agriculture and did a lot of good things. But come the 12th century, it was actually Hildegard century, um, they were so in bed with the feudal system, uh, which ran everything. And of course, they were running the education and the religion, that they were going down together because feudalism was failing. And uh, a new spirit was arising, which included merchants and therefore capitalism. And they, they were land-based, they were agricultural. And, and the new movement was much more about travel and seeing other parts of the world, etc. And so that is when Francis of Assisi and Dominic popped up in the early 13th century. But before them came these communes, young people fled the surf system, the feudal system, they couldn't get work because families were growing because the weather patterns had changed in Europe and you had a longer growing season. So families grew, but there wasn't work for young people. So to make a long story short, they fled to towns and overnight these towns became cities. And then you had a new movement, educational movement called universities, which were in no way um, connected to the monastic system. And they were, it came through Islam and scholasticism, which is about asking questions. It's a much more scientific approach to learning. So that's when Francis and Dominic came on and started their orders. And then in the 16th century, of course, you had the Protestant Reformation. And I really look at the Protestant Reformation as a series of lay orders because they were disenchanted by religion of the 16th century, which was obviously corrupt in so many ways. And so these reformers started their own movements. But he also had in the Catholic Church, Ignatius of Loyola starting the Jesuits in the late 16th century. So these are just some examples of Western history. But of course, realize there are orders among Hindus, among Buddhists, and even the Jews had the Essene movement in the first century and so forth. So again, I think the thing about an order different from a religion is it can move fast. It can respond to immediate needs. Religion is like a great big ship. And the bigger it is, the slower it is, and you can't steer it well, and you certainly can't start it. You don't even have brakes. <laughs> and so I think that's the difference between order and, and religion. And, and so orders uh, spring up for particular needs and um, at particular times. So anyway, I had this dream a few years ago, and it was unlike any dream I've ever had. It woke me up at exactly four in the morning, and the dream said very loudly to me, do it with several exclamation points. That's the language that woke me up. Do what? Start a new kind of order. That is one ecumenical, doesn't have any sort of religious ideology um, um, dictating to it from behind the scenes, behind the curtain. 
and that is focused on one issue today, which is saving the earth. And together we would make one vow. I promise to be the best lover of Mother Earth and the best defender of Mother Earth that I can be. And so um, I spoke to a young man uh, who I know, and it turned out he had had a dream similar. He had, and, and so we linked up, and then his girlfriend got involved too. So um, those two, one in their 20s, one in his young 30s, uh, are really the directors of the order. And, um, and um, I'm a kind of the elder or something, but um, uh, because the young people have to carry this and the, you know, the, the Franciscans and Dominicans, it was the appeal of the, the, uh, the vision uh, touched the young people who felt that there was this new vision, this new possibility for healthier religion that returns to the real teachings of Jesus and just bypass centuries of monastic dominance. And so, um, I think, uh, and so at our first ceremony where we took these vows, there were like 80 some people showed up and there were um, Protestants and Catholics and Jews and indigenous people and Buddhists. It was actually held in a Buddhist uh, temple in Berkeley. And um, and at least one atheist came up to you, a 26 year old woman. She said, uh, uh, I'm an atheist, but I read what you bought. I'm looking for a community that shares my values. I'm in on this too. And uh, the brother of Sister Dorothy Stang, who was martyred in the Amazon, uh, he showed up too, he drove up from Los Angeles. So uh, that was our first vow taking ceremony. And now we have these pods, that's what we call them, these different communities around, around some in North America, some in, in Peru, and some in Australia, and so forth. Um, and I, I just think that there's a potential for this because religion, in many respects, is failing. Uh, but it doesn't mean, as as uh, Deepak Chopper has said, just because people aren't going to church anymore, doesn't mean there's there's less evil in the world. <laughs> the world has not become more less more or has not become less evil. There's still a lot of evil, and there's still this need for community. And uh, so we meet online once a month, and and then people are doing their local things. The local the pod gets together, and and they talk about what this means to them, this vow that they take together, how do you apply it in the circumstances, the bioregion where you live? So um, I think there's something very logical about it, but when religion fails, does that mean we have nothing to look to, or do we gather in what previous generations called orders, um, but, uh, but strip it down to the basic? And all lifestyles are welcome, you can be celibate, you can be married, you can be unmarried, you can be gay, you can be straight. That's another reality of our time. And but but the focus is obviously the um the the future of Mother Earth. And the, I like the fact that the word sacred earth is in the in the title, because Thomas Berry says we will not save the earth if we do not see it as something sacred. That uh it's not enough just to have a political agenda or a um a moral agenda that what we're really talking about here is a, a more sacred relationship to the earth. And I would use your word again, more intimate. I think in many ways the word intimate and sacred are, are synonyms. Yeah. You're here. So beautiful. I uh, will look forward in our, in our behind the scenes uh, segment, Matthew, asking you a bit more about the order of the sacred earth and, potentially even, you know, how we can plant more seeds of collaboration with Reedy Toss Society and some of the things we're doing with our ambassadors. We'll save that for the behind the scenes segment that we do after our main podcast interview. And, and for folks who haven't yet joined our ambassador network, if you'd like to, this is one of the benefits of being an ambassador. You have access to these behind the scenes uh, discussions as well as other uh, video resources um, that we offer through the network. Um, and I, I have a couple things I will be uh, remiss if I don't ask you before we conclude our podcast, Matthew. And one is uh, coming from mixed ethnic heritage myself personally that includes uh, Mohawk, uh, Native American, along with Celtic, Germanic, Slovenian, etc. I've been uh, in my adult life keen to connect with different indigenous traditions. And I noticed, by the way, in your um, 
invitation called employing spiritual practices in the spirit of Hildegard of Bingen in, in the uh, back of your book about her, um, you lay out a number of uh, activities that we can choose to engage in and cultivate, including sweat lodge. I, 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 it struck me that that was included in there. Um, and I, I've noticed that with many of our indigenous traditions, alongside some of our other uh, more mainstream traditions, we've got information and wisdom regarding these times we're living in, sometimes referred to as prophecy. And of course, the Hopi people have carried a lot of this, as have Mohawk and others. And it, it blow, blows my mind and my heart, really, to, to see and hear and read that Hildegard painted a Hopi corn mother uh, in her artwork. How is that? I mean, I've got my sense of how this is possible, but I, I, I'm asking you, how is that possible centuries you know, before uh, Chris Columbus did what he did and all that sort of thing? What is going on here that there's this connection with her and the Hopi in the, in the 900 years ago? Well, They say history is written by the winners or whatever, whatever. But the point is that long before Columbus came and made a mess of things, <laughs> and as the, as the Native Americans tell me, you know, he didn't discover America. He was lost and he stumbled into America and uh, thought he had discovered it, but he was literally lost. So um, he ran into it. <laughs> but uh, the truth is that the, uh, that the Celts came to America long before Columbus. And they went back to Europe. And first of all, they didn't destroy things. They, they, I, they didn't come to redeem the native people. They didn't come in to um, convert them to Christianity. I think they arrived and together they sat down and talked about the holiness of creation, the sacredness of the earth, and how probably about how they teach their children about the sacredness of creation and how uh, the others teach theirs, but it, whatever. But they didn't make a mess, so we didn't know they were here. <laughs> so they went back, but the fact is the stories were carried on, and Hildegard was raised in a Celtic monastery. She went into the monastery at about the age of six. Well, first she went to a hermitess who was connected, and then she joined the monastery. But the point is that the Celtic legends and lores and stories were alive and well. And she actually says the first human being was a red man. And she paints, as you say, and, and you know, you could put this up when you run this. You could, we could give you the painting and you That'd could put it up. So we're talking about this, but it was actually a Native American who pointed this out to me. I was showing these slides in a lecture in Santa Fe. And um, during the discussion, the Native American said, did you see the Hopi corn mother in her painting? And I said, no, I didn't, even though I looked at the painting. But it took a Native American to see it. So, you know, I brought the slide up again. And sure enough, there are two Hopi corn mothers in her painting, which is about her own awakening. There's the fire coming over her head, like the Pentecost experience with the early disciples that Hildegard was applying to her own awakening at the age of 42, and um, but she paints these two pillars that if you look carefully, they are Hopi corn mothers. But what a perfect archetype to talk about waking up, about resurrection. And that's what the Hopi corn mother means. It looks like it's dead when the season's over, but it comes up again come spring, you see. So it's a perfect example of the resurrection and of our, our participating in awakening and waking up. And and so forth. So, um, and then there's another painting where she has a, what she calls a zealous head of God, and God is a red head. The head is red, and there too, she she brings in ideas about um, the first human being being red, so made of red earth. So um, uh, that's how a uh, uh, Native American woman tuned in to. Um, indigenous uh, lore uh, 900 years ago that uh, I think that the, the, the Celts got to the Americas and brought home some stories and they didn't leave a mess either, either sociologically or theologically and no one was killing anybody and uh, 
so they're forgotten. <laughs> but there actually are some, um, there is evidence there in, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's in Delaware or some state up in the Northeast that I visited. You saw some of these uh, monuments that are very much like those on the West Coast of, of Ireland. And I think more research has been done on that and more research deserves to be done on it. Yeah, but I again, your monument in, uh, is it Rhode Island, perhaps? Is it Rhode Island? Maybe it's there. I've been there, but I can't remember right now what state it was. But um, I've been very blessed to have Native Americans um, on my faculty. Uh, Buck Gostoris is the Lakota leader who um, was living in South Carolina, but having dreams for 10 years that he should work with white people because white people are running things and they aren't very smart. That's what he was getting from his dream. But he put it off and put it off and put it off. And finally, the dreams got more fierce. And so he looked around and he saw our program in creation spirituality. He said, well, this might be something I can tolerate. So to make a long story short, he, he drove, he and his wife, out to Oakland from South Carolina and showed up at my door, literally at the school, and uh, said, I'm here to help you. My dreams tell me I should. And make a long story short, he joined the faculty, set up a sweat lodge on campus for three years. And one of the objections to my work by Cardinal Ratzinger was, quote, I work too closely with Native Americans. I think what he meant by that is we had a sweat lodge on a Catholic campus and this freaked him out. But it didn't freak out. Our staff, faculty, students, we, we loved it. We learned so much from it. And his courses he taught on Native spirituality in our program. Then he went on to start a center in the state of Washington. And I did a vision quest within the year I was silenced. That was a big part of my vision quest. And, um, and then I joined them for some sun dances and so forth over the years. So anyway, I've been very blessed. And he's just one Native teacher. Jose Habdi is a Seneca woman and a Franciscan sister. She was on the faculty for years. She taught me a lot about ritual and our students too, and, um, and about other things. And so I've been, um, and I've attended uh, many uh, powwows and uh, or sweat lodges and so forth in many places. And they've always been very deep blessings for me. I, I don't think I would have survived, frankly, without those because the ceremonies are so earthy and cosmic and grounding and bodily that you just don't have these in churches where there are cushions and air condition and books to read and pages to read from. You know, and you don't bring your book in, prayer book into a sweat lodge. You bring your heart. And um, my first 20 minutes in the sweat lodge, I was sure I was going to die. I was looking for a fire extinguisher or an exit. And there was neither. So finally, I yielded to the experience. And that's when you go into an, another state. And that's the whole purpose of prayer, isn't it? To get, get into another state. But, you know, I had to learn the hard way how, um, how, how fable, no, how feeble some of our prayer forms are in, in the West. That we, we do have to face death together in a in a prayer circle. And that changes everything. I was so struck. Uh, I was invited to Sundance a number of years ago up in uh, Lakota country in Montana. And uh, we went into the sweat lodge to cool off after <laughs> dancing under the sun, which is just bizarre. And yeah. There's such a profound symbolic connection between that ceremonial rite and the crucifixion of Jesus. I, it, it blew me away to ex experience that unexpectedly. I know it's not like somebody explained to me ahead of time that there's this incredible symbolic connection, but it's there. It's very real. Yes. Very interesting that you experienced that. I did too. In fact, in the summer day that we were dancing, um, there was the sun was big and white and round and white, it was white. And I saw it, it just hit me, the native and the Christian, that it was white like a host is in the, in the Eucharist liturgy. And, and, there, and then there's this tree that people are bound to, 
and uh, and there's a sacrifice vow. So the whole thing just kind of hit me like symbols that the two flat crashed together in a very positive sense for me. The, the church that I grew up in was called Blessed Sacrament, and that is the host, the white host is the name for the white host, but that became the son. So I too have had that marriage of my Christian archetype, if you will, and the native. And it, it is so powerful and real and bodily. And uh, you don't forget those things. No, no, we don't. We don't. Maybe we'll pick this thread up in our, in our behind the scenes, Matthew. And, but before we sign off, I, I want to ask you about creation spirituality, because I, I, I believe this is one of the threads running through so many different traditions around the world. And perhaps one could even make the claim that it's a thread that runs through all of our ancestral traditions. And it's just a matter of how far back in time we go to get there. And I want to quote you from the book. Uh, you say, I have devoted my life to recovering the creation spirituality tradition because even though it's the oldest tradition in the Bible, the tradition of Jesus and the tradition of the greatest mystics of the church, it's little known. And my reading of, of your book on Hildegard with respect to creation spirituality is that this is along with the original instructions. This is the living uh, original connection, original blessing, original understanding that we can find in all our traditions, Matthew. And I love how you're reclaiming it and restoring it and really resurrecting it within the context of the Judeo-Christian tradition, particularly where we know we need so much healing. And I was hoping you could just share a bit with us about your view on creation spirituality. What What is it and how is it different from some of the other versions out there and why is it important right now? Well, this tradition was named for me when I studied uh, in Paris, a doctor studied spirituality with Père Chenou, French Dominican. And uh, I'll never forget the moment in class as that Paul falling off his horse when he said there are these two traditions in the West. One begins with the fall, and it's about the fall and redemption. And the other begins with creation. And they are very different beginnings. And it just brought everything together for me. Yes, to begin with creation. I grew up in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin still has a presence of Native American spirit on its land. I had a lot of dreams as a child of Native American dreams. And, um, and you know, nature is there. So that was the context in which I, I grew up. And um, <clears throat> But the whole idea that sin comes first is so anthropocentric. Human sin, right? But the other species don't. Thomas Merton, the great Catholic monk, said that every non-two-legged creature is a saint. So that means for 13.8 billion years, there was no sin. So why would you begin religion talking about this anthropocentric thing? Well, because modern consciousness does that. It begins with us. It's all about I think, therefore I am. But I sin, therefore I am. But no, your pre-modern conscious, whether indigenous or these medieval saints like Hildegard and Eckhart and the others, they don't begin with sin because they don't begin with the human. They begin with the whole, with the macrocosm. And this is postmodern thinking too. David Bohm, the physicist, says, I'm a postmodern physicist who begins with the whole. And that's how we have to begin again because it's the whole of Mother Earth that's in collapse today. Then we can talk about our mistakes, our sins, and say, well, what do we bring to the table? Well, one thing we bring is our creativity, as we're talking about, and our science, our intellects, et cetera, et cetera, and our passion, so and our caring, et cetera. So um, for me, these are two different versions of religion, and uh, I've chosen the second. Now, history chose original sin, even though Jesus never heard of original sin. But the fourth century, St. Augustine came up with the idea of original sin. But what else happened in the fourth century is the church took over the empire. So you're going to run an empire. Original sin is a really practical thing to have. It gets people in line, obeying on their knees, and going out and doing whatever they're told to do. 
But um, it's not biblical. No Jew believes in original sin. Jesus never heard of original sin, and yet we have a religion walking around today that begins with original sin and says it's Christian. Well, it's not Christ-like. Jesus doesn't think that way. Ellie Weissel says, not only is original sin not in the Bible, he said, it is alien to Jewish thinking. It introduces a notion that is just foreign to Jewish consciousness, because Jewish consciousness is about the goodness of creation, Genesis 1. So um, that's what original blessing means. Blessing is the theological word for goodness, and that's, um, you know, the, the, my language for uh, creation spirituality. And it is these four paths we talked about, and that power of creativity, the third path that we've talked about, you know, that's our way out of sin. That's our way out of, of, uh, out of destroying the planet, is to tap it deeper and deeper into our creativity. This is where science comes in and technology, of course, but also music and art and, and new forms of education that uh, prepare uh, a generation to put the uh, health of Mother Earth ahead of uh, human agendas exclusively. And as you're talking about, uh, reinventing economics and politics to, to match what we now know about the, how we, how we uh, preserve Mother Earth. So all this is the energy of free spirituality in those four paths we talked about. And um, <clears throat> this, is, as you say, is the, the way of these wonderful people, mystics like Hildegard and Aquinas and Francis and, and um, Eckhart and Mechtil, Julian. And then when the, when the great bubonic plague hit in the 14th century, that kind of crashed free spirituality because people were so freaked out by the anxiety of, uh, of the plague, which is a horrible thing. And of course, they had no science to deal with it to understand it or anything like a vaccine. So you can kind of think about what the world went through recently with coronavirus, but subtract science and vaccines, and you really have a, a dire uh, situation. So in many ways, Christ spirituality kind of was, uh, was a victim of the bubonic plague. Although that's the genius of Julian of Norwich, is that she wrote a book during the bubonic plague it's very likely she lost a husband and a child in the bubonic plague, which, which is not uh, negative toward nature, just the opposite. She says, God is the goodness of nature, etc. So she, she remains very committed to this creation spiritual perspective. But she's the last one, and she was ignored until the 17th She Her book wasn't even published until the 17th century. And, uh, and then it was too late, in a way, because cosmism went the way of of sin and redemption, and Catholicism did, if you will, and of course the the invasion of the indigenous peoples around the world by European Christians uh, was anything but pretty, and it was based entirely on redemption. That you people are savages because you don't, you're not redeemed, etc. And that had such an impact on history and on on the. Uh, the destruction, the genocide toward indigenous peoples. Uh, it's so pitiful, but this is why having the indigenous people still with us, uh, being able to speak these truths, uh, again, is a wonderful gift to renew and um, refresh all the religions in the world. And at this time, that's what we need is the wisdom of all religions plus science if uh, humanity is going to survive and if the earth as we know it is going to survive, going to survive humanity <clears throat> oh matthew it's it's so wonderful to have this this time with you and i'm sitting here thinking my gosh we might have to uh explore doing another uh podcast oh. interview with you sometime in the coming months because you just have so much insight and, and wisdom to share with us and I, I know we should probably transition and wrap up today's episode and transition to our behind the scenes. I still want to ask you about Bernard of Clairvaux, the etymology of the term cathedral. I want to ask you something about the 
book you wrote with Rupert Sheldrake on the physics of angels, but maybe we'll uh, save this for uh, our little behind the scenes chat. And then, you know, if, if you'd be so gracious and willing at some point, a few months down the road, perhaps we have another episode together as well. But uh, on, on behalf of the Why on Earth community, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me and have this conversation that we can share out with the world and with our audience. And uh, before we conclude the podcast itself, uh, if you would, the, the floor is yours, if, if there's anything else. Oh, and, and let me say, I'm sure folks would like to uh, learn more about you, your work, and get your books at matthewfox.org. And uh, can also go to daily meditations with matthewfox.org um, to connect with you there too. And we'll include those links in the show notes as well. But uh, before signing off, Matthew, the floor is yours, my friend. If there's anything else you'd like to share with our audience today. Well, I've very much enjoyed this conversation and um, that you did your homework with Hildegard. So let's close with a brief uh, poem from Hildegard. Glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars. Gaze at the beauty of Earth's greenings. Now think, what delight God gives to humankind with all these things? Who gives all these shining, wonderful gifts, if not God? There is no creation that does not have a radiance. So I think that that's via positiva talk, and we need that. Uh, humans need to be in love in order to get out of our couches and make a difference. So I thank Hildegard, and I thank you for our conversation, and, and I love your organization, including even the name, Why on Earth? Well, thank you, Matthew. And uh, yeah, to be continued, all of this, it's uh, such a joy to connect and chat with you today. Thank you. You bet. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code WHYONEARTH, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.